Uh, welcome everyone to this 2020 edition of APA's annual meeting. Uh, it's uh, our 21st annual meeting and our, our, obviously it's going to be our largest to date. This is one of the few benefits of the pandemic. We, we get now to be joined live by people from, from New Zealand, China, uh, India, all over the, the EU, UK, Scandinavia, uh, Canada, uh, South America, and coast to coast in the US. So uh, that's a tremendous thing. Uh, it's really, really nice to, to have this uh, privilege and pleasure of interacting all with you together. We very rarely, if ever, have this opportunity, uh, even if via uh, a strange platform. Uh, I'm going to, uh, in a moment, turn things over to Vaughna. Uh, you're all free, of course, to come and go as you please, and we'll be taking coffee breaks uh, between each speaker. Uh, each speaker will have approximately an hour. Uh, they all have a lot to tell us, um, and then we'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A, so everyone can jump in. Um, I think the, the protocol, the best protocol is for us to mute our mics when we're not speaking, uh, and that will give the best sound quality uh, to whoever is speaking. Uh, and if you have questions that you want to ask uh, during, the, during the various presentations, you could always enter them in the chat room. Uh, and then uh, we can, uh, you know, if you enter them in the chat room, then the moderator can, can bring them to the attention of the speaker and credit you. Um, and so forth. That might be one way to go. Okay. Um, so without further ado, uh, and we, we're still on time, and I, I'm so impressed some of you have stayed up so late uh, to be with us and, and, and have arisen so early to be with us. So thank you so much uh, for making this commitment. Uh, and uh, I just now want to introduce our co-chair, uh, uh, Vaughna. Uh, who really needs no introduction, but Vaughna is the matriarch, of, if we have one, of APA. She's certainly the matriarch. Vaughna and I met uh, 26 years ago. I don't want to remind you, Vaughna, of the, where the time has gone, but it's 26 years ago that we met at the first international in Vancouver, and we've been colleagues and, and, and friends ever since then. And Vaughna's a founding vice president of APA and a previous president of the ASPCP and, uh, and, and also runs the Excalibur Center for Applied ethics um, uh, in New Jersey and has been a an active contributor to philosophical practice, a pioneer of philosophical practice in the U.S. and worldwide for many years, has attended and presented and taught master classes at numerous ICPPs, has published all kinds of work uh, in, in, in many journals and, and invited book chapters, and she's just um, an amazing person. So, uh, Vaughn, I will invite you to welcome everyone and, and to introduce Lydia. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you for that very nice introduction, Lou. I will try and live up to it. Uh, it's early in the morning, so. <laughs> um, I just want to say welcome to everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is for you. I think Bettina gets the uh, prize for that from New Zealand, it being one o'clock in the morning. What I uh, want to say is that um, I'm just welcoming everybody. Uh, I think it's, it's, I would like to sit down and, you know, have our dinner and converse with you privately and all the rest of it. So, you know, this, I miss our, our usual annual meetings. But as Lewis pointed out, we have the advantage this way of uh, having people from all over the world joining us, new friends, old friends, and uh, so um, in that regard, uh, this, this is a new adventure, and it's, uh, I think it'll be fun for all of us. We have uh, some wonderful papers coming up, and uh, so uh, I want to keep my remarks to a minimum uh, as we have such a full program. So um, with no more ado then, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Lydia. Uh, Lydia has so many credentials. Uh, this, it's hard to uh, pick something to say about her. She is uh, uh, a visiting professor at Tufts University and uh, also president of the Israeli Society for Philosophical Practice. Um, I've known Lydia since for many, many years, since uh, I first met her in uh, Vancouver at our first international conference that was organized by uh, Lou and Ron Lahav. And, uh, even then, I was impressed by her charm and erudition, and I knew she, her papers and workshops have been a joy to attend uh, over the years at international conferences. Um, 
Lydia has publications in so many different uh, areas of uh, philosophical practice. Um, she has wonderful topics, love and humor. I mean, how can you go wrong with that? And she's explored uh, that in great detail and uh, done some wonderful work there. Her last book, um, I believe, is uh, Philosophy, Humor, and the Human Condition, which I haven't yet read. Lydia publishes faster than I can read sometimes. Uh, she uh, uh, has some wonderful books that I recommend. Uh, they're in the uh, introduction uh, that uh, Lou sent out earlier. What I'd like to emphasize about Lydia, however, is that she is so generous with her time in promoting philosophical practice. Uh, she's organized in innumerable uh, things for us. Uh, she's editor of two collections of essays from previous conferences. Uh, it's been an honor for me to be a contributor to those. And uh, also, she's now editor of a new uh, series on philosophical practice, the Lexington series. So um, that's an exciting new development. So uh, Lydia, despite her own creative uh, work is also always helping us uh, promote philosophical practice and give us new uh, areas in which to contribute. So uh, today she's going to be speaking on uh, happiness and uh, what is it, happiness and, and misery. She's including that. All right, the title is uh, Meaning, Happiness and Misery, an Inquiry into Philosophy, Scope, and limitations. And I look forward to her papers uh, as always. So with no more ado, Lydia, uh, we'd love to hear okay. from you. Thank you, Vona. You look beautiful as always. This is absolutely amazing. 26 years ago, I don't know, you met Lou. I guess that we met on the same conference and I cannot forget your appearance. You stood up, uh, you had a comment and uh, you looked absolutely marvelous and you haven't changed a bit. So I'm very glad that you can have me. Hello, Lou, hello, all the people, some I know, some I don't. Can you hear me well? Is it yeah. all right? Yeah. Okay. So I want to, to say a few things in guise of, a, of, a, of an introduction. Whatever I had to say about philosophical practice, I gathered in two books, one's called The Thinking Philosopher's Responsibility and the other, Taking Philosophy Seriously. One from 2017 and the other for 2018. This is new. This is, uh, you know, you, you always think that you are going to, to finish once and for all and you never. And then once you think you have, you have new thoughts, and uh, I'm very glad to share them with you. But you have to remember while you listen to me that first I have to move next week from my apartment. So I've been packing all day and carrying boxes and uh, I'm not in the best shape I could be. This will be one of the reasons that I will have to leave the conference earlier today. And second, that these are really uh, only thoughts at, at, at the level of uh, uh, some ideas that I would like to share with you and see actually what you think about. Now I'm taking a risk here because I remember in one of the conferences I talked about meaning and I was very much attacked. Uh, so um, I want to say that I always felt uncomfortable with uh, the taken for granted idea that there is meaning in life or that we know what it is or that if we don't know what objective meaning is, it's certain that we can have a, a subjective meaning. And it was from my early days as a student that I could not understand how the question of the meaning of life could be changed by the question the meaning in life without any residue. The second thing I feel uncomfortable with during all these years is the idea of narrative. Many people say philosophical practice is about narrative or psychology or our lives is about narrative, change narratives, etc. Um, I always felt that, of course, we can change narratives, we can create narratives, but they are a little bit, uh, uh, you know, hazardous, a little bit uh, um, not very tidy because you can always pick this fact or the other fact and link this in a way that they will appear coherent and tell a story that's true. 
but at the price of leaving many other facts out of the picture. So uh, one very important aspect of the human condition gets lost when we try to tell a narrative. And I am very well aware of the fact that we need to have a coherent narrative and that we need to have meaning, but I'm also a philosopher. So I cannot just abide by whatever needs we may have. I have also to scrutinize them uh, rationally and to say what I think about them. Now, a second uh, point that I would like to, to, to mention at the beginning as an introduction is that this uh, talk that would appear very, very, I disappeared. I'm sorry. We hear you, Lydia, please continue. Okay, I just clicked something and I we, cannot see you. Okay. We, we uh, see you and hear you. Give me a moment because I, okay, I cannot see you. Press uh, the, the, the gallery view on the top left, the gallery uh, view. Yes. That's okay. I'm here. I'm back. Thank you. Sorry. I just touched the mouth. The second thing I wanted to say is that this is a vicious uh, lecture, you know, meaning, happiness, misery. But uh, um, I noticed that sooner or later, even political philosophers actually uh, reach existential uh, problems and questions. I was very much astonished to find out that at the origin of what's called the pessimistic controversy in the 19th century, the one that followed Schopenhauer views, uh, pessimistic views of life, the one that Nietzsche tried to answer, but there were many, many others. At the root of that was a reaction, if you want, to the idea of the social progress of the 18th century and also in Germany, the attempt that they had to create, a, uh, to, to think that if they create a new country, a new state, all problems would be solved with social progress. So the pessimist, I was very much alarmed to hear, wanted to show people that even if they receive what they want from the socialist, let's say, they won't be happy. So that was the agenda behind many of the arguments. So this is one aspect in which existential uh, questions are actually tied to political ones. Lou Marinoff with these recent fantastic books about war and peace uh, reaches the conclusion that it's all about changing our own uh, consciousness about uh, things and reaching the peaceful way of life individually first. This is interesting. I was very shocked as well many years ago when Martha Nussbaum said about the Hellenistic philosophers, how is it possible that they try to change uh, each consciousness, each person individually uh, without understanding that we have to go to the laws and make a change at this level. So I also think that laws or not laws, it at the end boils down to personal change, to existential problems, and this was the lengthy introduction to my lecture. One more point of introduction. I'm talking about philosophy, scope, and limitations. From the beginning, I think my first, my first article about philosophical practice was three problems of philosophical practice. I was always pointing not only the, the power of philosophy, but also its limitations, its problems. So I want today to confront with you the limitations of philosophy that I was made aware of by people who actually underwent a terrible loss, uh, losing a child, even losing a husband. They, were, they told me that not religion, no philosophy, nothing can help in those uh, situations. Also, Ora Gringard wanted for the next conference in Russia to have on a panel about Hamlet, uh, about uh, others from other figures from the literature and to think how philosophy can actually help those people. Finally, we are celebrating in a way 150 years of psychology. And we are using very easily the word doctors of the souls for philosophers. And uh, I think we should revise together this term and try to understand 
are philosophers actually doctors of the souls? In which sense were they ever, etc.? So let me begin with that. We are often told that philosophers are doctors of, of the souls, or they used to be doctors of the soul. So I looked into that and I found out that actually many philosophers were medical doctors. They really thought that it was philosophy's business to take care of the health of the soul as well as other doctors would take care of the health of the body. Uh, how did they do that? They do that through the concept of virtue. As you know, the main idea was that virtue would lead to happiness. So for many years, the idea was that if you are able to be more virtuous, you are able to be more happy, and the person who is going to help you become more virtuous would be uh, the philosophers. So in that sense, we could say that the philosophers were doctor of the souls, of the souls. Now, nowadays, and from the 19th century on, we have abandoned the idea that a philosopher will help you uh, reach a virtue. There is, a, I have written about that, about the revolution of uh, health of the soul uh, that uh, disengages itself from virtue. Now, we do not think that health of the soul is related to virtue anymore. So we have a big question, what could be the role of philosophers here if we are talking about philosophers, about the, the health of the soul? Now I looked further, I looked if ever philosophers uh, played the role of, let's say, psychiatrists to ever address mental illnesses. I know that in the philosophical practice movement, some people think that philosophy should, and maybe can, because it should replace psychiatrists. Uh, um, so it depends for which indices. I have not found any philosopher in the past that said that philosophy uh, can address also the mentally ill. To the contrary, uh, Spinoza, for example, said quite clearly that it's not for the mentally ill. Many other philosophers assumed as well, uh, except Seneca that was rather uh, um, explicit about that. It said that philosophy can benefit the mentally ill, although it cannot make them better or help them change uh, for, the, for the best. So what do we understand by mentally ill? Uh, can we count depression and anxiety among these? Well, I really don't know. I think there might be a difference between melancholy, melancholy and depression. I think philosophers did address melancholy but maybe not the common, the modern term of depression. I don't know what's actually the relationship. I remember that we had a very uh, elaborated lecture on that in the IP APA that I attended in, in New York. This is a question uh, for us to continue uh, um, probing. About anxiety, I, I know that there are some uh, uh, assertion that says that, for example, the Epicureans, Epicurus, and especially Lucretius, do address uh, anxiety and maybe have a very strong argument that uh, um, the fear of death would be an unconscious fear that would be at the, at the source of many things that we, we, we do and do, do not do. So I wouldn't like to restrict philosophy from the outset and say, okay, only uh, rational people can uh, uh, address it. It's written for rational people, but I would not like to at the outset, this person is rational, this person is not. A mentally ill person is not rational enough. A person in depression should not read philosophers or in anxiety should not. I leave it an open question. I'm just saying that in the history of philosophy, mentally ill people were not addressed directly and even uh, considered as excluded because of the rationality that the text uh, demanded and about depression and uh, anxiety, I am with no good answer uh, as to uh, uh, if philosophy can help or not. Okay, so this was the first point, 150 years of uh, psychology. We are calling ourselves doctors of the soul. What do we mean by that? Should we go and probe 
a little bit uh, more about the history of medicine, the history of philosophy and the history of psychiatry, that would be interesting. A second point is that regardless of uh, what philosophy did before psychology arrived, since psychology uh, was created at the end of the 19th century in the beginning of the 20th century, a new idea was introduced in Western civilization. It's called therapy. This idea that uh, already Freud began uh, introducing it changed its content with many different psychological uh, therapies that were offered, or psychological schools. But the main idea, remain, uh, is, the main idea remained the same. It's a radical departure for all previous philosophic ideas. Not only did Freud single-handedly dismiss all philosophic ideas as too optimistic, but later therapies also focused uh, much like Freud, but even less ambitiously, on small incremental uh, uh, changes, not grand revolutions, not rebirth, not uh, um, a lot of changes in one's life, but getting better a little bit in a very local way. I have also some psychologists tell me that they cannot cure anything. They can just let the person live better with whatever they have. So the idea of therapy, and I teach a course about the ideas in uh, Western civilization, the last idea, which is not philosophical, but psychological, changes all the previous ideas. You can see why and how if I tell you the list of ideas that I can identify. I see, for example, in ancient Greece, the idea of eudaimonia or flourishing, you know, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. So whatever the differences between the three of them, you can still see that uh, they are actually offering you a way of uh, um, being happy, if you want, or harmonious, uh, or bringing the most of whatever you have inside into the world by different means, depending on Socrates, Plato, or, or Aristotle. The idea of flourishing does not differentiate between the human being and the citizen, between the man and the citizen at the time. It's taken for granted that you cannot be happy in a state that is unjust. So, but this is the eudaimonia. It, it, it helps you uh, through reason to actually bring together the various factions of uh, your being. You know very well that when uh, Athens lost its independence, uh, when it was conquered by Alexander from Macedonia and made into uh, an imme immense empire, uh, uniting Persia and Egypt and uh, Palestine also, and many other uh, areas, so philosophy, of course, changed because it wanted to adapt itself to the times and the idea of flourishing and the idea that one's happiness is not to be uh, differentiated along uh, personal lines and, and uh, political lines or com communitarian lines uh, could not uh, uh, subside anymore because it was an immense empire and people could not identify with that and also uh, there was an immense unrest. People did not know the day, uh, what the day would bring since Alexander from Macedonia died without leaving any heirs and immediately the, the wars of succession uh, began. So philosophy at that time, uh, the third century before Christ, three schools were created at the same time, Stoicism, Epicureanism and uh, Pyrrhonism. And these schools continued as uh, a fashion more or less till the fifth century uh, after Christ, which is, which is quite amazing. They were, they were brought uh, to, to, to Rome uh, as well. You know, the Romans uh, venerated the Greeks and thanks to that, we have a, a memory of these uh, schools that also influence very much uh, the Renaissance and the, and the modern periods and are influential to this day. So now the new ideal is ataraxia of peace of mind. And, um, it's different from flourishing. It says that the content of happiness is actually peace of mind and not 
uh, flourishing. And it's interesting to see that there are three ways that are being created in the West at the same time that can lead you to peace of mind. Of course, we have also the ways of the East of which we are more, more familiar, uh, Buddhism and uh, uh, Hinduism, and then later uh, Zen Buddhism, also Taoism, of course, I, I cannot go there. So the fifth century after Christ, the Middle Ages begin, and with them a new ideal becomes uh, the sole one possible in the West. It's called salvation. Of course, it began before. It existed in Judaism. It was uh, endorsed by the Christians. The Christians uh, existed well before the fifth century after Christ, but you know what happened in Europe, the church became the sole uh, way of life and the sole uh, way to live was to try to achieve, to achieve salva salvation, which meant not on earth and not by your own means, but after life and by God's grace. So the old tradition of ancient Greeks and Hellenistic times disappeared in the 13th century there were actually even a law saying that a person who says that he or she can be happy by their own means is actually to be burned. You know, this is, this is, this is something un unacceptable. So, uh, you know, the, this is a book to write, you know, the, the persecution of the happy. You know, you, you, you can share misery with people. We say that it's difficult, but to share happiness, believe me, it's absolutely impossible. <laughs> there is no room for that. Okay. So we have salvation in the West for 1,000 years. And, and then uh, slowly and slowly, uh, that ideal uh, di never disappeared from our lives. We have religious people around us. But uh, the 17th century, the 18th century, the Enlightenment actually, uh, brought a new version of uh, salvation. If you want a social version, that's called redemption here and now. That would be the ideal of the enlightenment. Here it means on earth and now, if not now, maybe in the near future when we manage to get uh, uh, our science and our technology working and then we can, uh, you know, there won't be any corona, there won't be any problem, there won't be any famine or any other uh, problems. We are going to solve all the problems of humanity and create a heaven on earth uh, so this is the here and the now means, if not in the 17th or 18th century, well, a little bit after that, really they thought that they are going to solve the remaining of Newton's problems very, very quickly. So um, redemption here and now in philosophy, it's very interesting. You have philosopher like Spinoza that takes the idea of redemption or salvation, but says, listen, I'm going to give you whatever religion gives you in philosophic terms, and you can actually redeem yourself through your own means in your life. And it will also continue in eternity because since Christianity, we are accustomed to have a, uh, eternal life. So I have to give you an alternative to that and he does. And uh, Spinoza's uh, solution is continued by Schopenhauer, by Nietzsche, by Santayana, not with the same success I think that Spinoza managed, but we have a new ideal which is uh, redemption here and now in your own life, personal philosophic redemption. Yes, this is a new idea. This is absolutely not the ideal of salvation in the Middle Ages that had to go through church and God, and the priest, of course. You couldn't just save yourself. The mystics were in terrible problems in the in the Renaissance and before, if they had a direct access to 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 God. Okay, so this would be uh, the fourth ideal. Now, uh, in the 19th century, you have a fifth ideal called self-realization. This is the ideal of romanticism. It's different from uh, uh, flourishing. Flourishing actually assumes that we are all more or less built in the same way. Self-realization says, no, everyone is built differently. I don't want you to put me on the same uh, with the other. I have my own thing going on. He has her own thing. She has her own thing. Anyway self-realization, you should realize your own uh, self and this would be the content of, 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 uh, of uh, the new idea that Romanticism brought. And the 20th century brought the last philosophic ideal, the way I see it, which is called authenticity. And it's the ideal of the existential philosophies that says, okay, 
forget all the former ideas they talked about happiness. We, we know better, no happiness here. But once you understand the human condition as it is, you can at least be authentic, live with anxiety or whatever. That's all right. But, but you won't be living a lie. So authenticity was and is the last um, idea that we may have. Now, when you have this, this, this gorgeous line of ideas, you know, that we can tell uh, clients and you can tell students about and they can choose out of them, then we have a last one called therapy from the psychologist, which actually there's not much to tell there. There is no big idea. There is no big ambition. It's to get a little bit better, find, I, I meet you where your problem is and I really don't know what it entails, but I can bring a bibliography. It entails something very, very humble, doesn't promise much, doesn't talk about a worldview, doesn't talk about human nature, doesn't talk even about a diagnosis, but not even about a, a prescription. We are just get, getting a little bit better and helping you cope a little bit better with whatever predicament you, you are in. Okay? So, 150 years of psychology, I wanted to talk about the doctors of the soul, and I wanted to talk about 100 years of a therapy ideal that was brought into the world. And now back to philosophy. So if we say, okay, psychology gives us only therapy, what can we do as philosophers? So we can do many things. One thing that we can do is uh, uh, actually, uh, educating oneself or others according to philosophy rich heritage of ideals. In this way, we can bring meaning to our lives. For example, we can say, uh, we can tell people uh, uh, this, this philosophy, the other philosophy, the ethics works on the basis of a vision of the world, the vision of human nature. We can tell people, uh, do you want to flourish? Do you want to be peaceful? Do you want to be saved? Do you want to be, say, philosophically? Do you have to self-realize, to be authentic? And we have various philosophies that offer each of these ideas, and, and they have to choose, like in a big mall, a big supermarket, and then we offer the idea, and we make them read text, and we say, look, look here, Seneca and the Picarus, and it's wonderful. And then you have a way of life in which you are in reality and you have an ideal and you imagine that person being a stoic or being plato or going in or out to the cave or being spinoza and your life gets meaning because you understand that you are moving towards an ideal you can maybe never reach it but you know where you are you know what the world is what human nature is what's the diagnosis of the human condition what's the prescription what you have to do and you are part of humanity advancing toward the realization of this idea that you have chosen because there are many ideas. The explanation is that there are many temperaments. You have to choose according to your temperaments. Okay? Not only the big ideal, but the, the uh, philosophy that, that you prefer, like Epicureanism or Stoicism or uh, Peonism in order to be peaceful in the West, let's, let's say. So, we are happy with that because as Nietzsche says, the role of philosophy has always been to bring meaning in, one, in one's life. Uh, we need meaning, what to do? We need knowledge, we need meaning, we need happiness, we need many, many things, but meaning, some people said, you know, uh, that without meaning, we cannot survive. I forgot the name of that great psychiatrist uh, uh, that did, that said that in the 20th century of uh, surviving the, the camps, uh, the one who created logotherapy, uh, without meaning we get ill, he says. So Nietzsche himself says we can suffer any suffering, that's no problem, as long as we are giving a meaning to suffering. What we are born apparently is meaningless suffering. Remember the, the lady that lost her husband, the, the, the husband that lost a child, meaningless suffering. This is what we cannot have. So we need a meaning for that. We need a worldview that would account for our suffering, then we can actually maybe survive 
many different uh, uh, problems and, and meaningless suffering that we have in our lives once we are giving meaning. So this is one way. So this way is characterized by the meaning it provides through handling the fear of meaningless suffering. This was Nietzsche's ideal. So depending on the ideal chosen, let me add, this path sometimes minimizes suffering along with the significance it grants it. So we can also minimize suffering if we find the cause of suffering. We annul the cause, we can also annul the, the, the suffering. Not only do we have meaning, we have an explanation for the suffering and we can get better a little bit with the suffering. Okay, so now it gets interesting because we were accustomed to that. And maybe some people who read Nietzsche were accustomed to his critique, but you know it was Nietzsche and he was a little bit crazy, so what to do. So there are two criticisms of this path that yield alternative uses of philosophy. One criticism states that meanings are lies, simple lies, and the other that ideals are ineffective. And each comes in either a gloomy or a cheerful version. So let me just introduce briefly these four paths. So the first criticism that says that meanings are lies leads to tragic philosophy. I just finished another book about uh, Nietzsche's uh, French uh, followers and uh, not only Bataille, Deleuze, but also uh, Clément Rosset was there, a French philosopher who considered himself the sole follower of Nietzsche because he's the only one that sets a tragic philosophy along the lines of Nietzsche. While all the others, the postmoderns, not very clear what they're doing, tragic, they are not. So Clément Rosset created a tragic philosophy I hope that through my chapter on him, it will become clearer. There is one book on him in English, one and a half. Uh, all his books in French uh, are very readable. And he says, uh, listen, people, life is tragic. The whole idea of nature that all these philosophies are based on, the one that gives you meaning, the idea of nature is a construct. And uh, uh, it's, tries to say that nature, the way we see it, is uh, coherent, ordained. Uh, it has, we need it in order to relax, but it's not like that. It's chaotic, there is a terrible hazard going on, and if it's not, we cannot know that. Uh, the human being is living a life that is utterly tragic. No knowledge is of reality is, uh, really possible, we have no access to the real, we cannot bear it. We cannot bear reality, we cannot bear knowledge of reality when we, we are brought into encounter with reality face to face, we, 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 we cannot stand that. We lose our mind, we go to philosophies of meanings, we cannot stand the suffering involved, the idea that everything that we are does not correspond to whatever reality really brings to us. So we, we need to feel at home in order to survive. Or we need an explanation why we are not at home. And tragic philosophy says, listen, this is home and, and get used to it. And, and every time you try to run away from that, you know, the joke is on you. So tragic philosophies are different from philosophies of the absurd. Philosophies of the absurd, I always thought they're very funny. They're crying about the absurd. They forgot that the absurd is a c category of, the, of, of nonsense, of, of comedies. No, they are very serious. They are, they, are, they are yearning for meaning. But according to their own philosophies, it's not possible to have meaning. So what do they want? Sartre and Camus, even the atheist one, what do they want? Only when you know that Camus has written a PhD on Neoplatonism, or, so you understand that he's yearning, he's a, he's a mystic, you know, at least. I don't want to say the same about Sartre, but at least Camus, there is, there is something that's, that's being left unsaid there about reality. Why say that it's absurd when you have no proof that it should or has any meaning? So according to which criteria can it be absurd? The fact that... She, it doesn't correspond to what you think should be, this is not a good argument. So revise please your views of absurd philosophies. They are still, they have an unfinished business with meaning, okay? Uh, okay, so tragic philosophies negate meaning. 
but they do offer happiness. They say, listen, once you look at reality in the face and look at yourself in the face and other people, you can still be happy. Of course, it's a, you know, it's a, like a tragic happiness. Think about flamenco, you know, like, like, like a fan, fantastic dancing in the middle of the night, yes? You know, free joy, tremendous joy. We are just dancing. Think about a very good cl club, the way I would like to die. Dancing and being, being you know, trampled under, under the feet of the dancers, knowing that there is another generation. This is actually the, 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 the kind of happiness that tragic philosophy can bring. They say happiness is the sole thing, so the only thing that has any value in life because it's not dependent on anything else. You have no good reason to be happy. You know? The only thing is that if you are, you have this kind of joy of life, that's the only thing of value because you know how fragile it is. But you have actually no reason. Between the unhappy and the happy man, there is no difference of facts. There is another kind of difference. And this Clément Rosset says it's like grace of God. It's like the joy of life. It's not clear who gets it, who doesn't get it, and why. You know? Once you lost it, you cannot rekindle it. Nobody else can help you. It has to come from you or from some kind of grace. It doesn't talk of God. It doesn't know how it comes about. So I have my own criticism of tragic philosophies because they cannot, they depend on joy for their happiness, but they cannot explain where it comes from. I have written a book on the human condition that try to explain how you can more uh, uh, seriously a little bit and more uh, certainly approach joy uh, slowly and slowly and make it yours and not only wait for some kind of grace. So this is in the book of the 219 about the human condition in Palgraf Macmillan. I cannot go there now. I have to continue. So my version is a little bit more cheerful than the one of Clément Rosset. I told you that one criticism states that meanings are lies and uh, it comes in either a gloomy or cheerful version. Clément Rosset version is gloomy despite the happiness that it talks about. Mine is cheerful. It's done through humor. It's done through changing the tragic aspect of life into the comical and then having the two balanced about the view of the human being as ridiculous, embracing ridicule, you get uh, to get freed of ridicule, you have abiding joy uh, and uh, fantastic benefits both personal and social that, that ensue. So this is if you want for you to read or for me to explain on another occasion. Let's talk about now another option if you don't like the tragic uh, criticism of the path of meanings. The other criticism stay, says that uh, ideals are ineffective. And again, they are not lies, they are ineffective. And it comes in a gloomy and cheerful version. So that ideal is ineffective is the, the thesis of Michel de Montaigne. You know, this is another book I had to finish, so I had to go in, in Michel de Montaigne. And, and he is amazing. He cannot even take the ancients seriously. He is sure that they are joking, you know. He respects them. He adores them. But come on, he says, these are human beings. It's, you know, they have the great sense of humor. What does the Stoic says, sage says that he can be happy on the rack? What? You know, Montaigne could take philosophy very seriously till he got uh, his father illness, and then it was gone. You know, this philosopher was joking. He's a human being. He needs philosophy to work for him as a human being. These are ideas there, and they are ineffective. And it's terrible for him to try to be a stoic in his pain or to try to be an epicurean and to stick to one philosophy. He really thinks this is, this cannot be serious. So he, in terms of wisdom, he says, all we can do is try to find out our own means towards wisdom. We can try to, you know, just educate our judgment better in order to judge better in each situation and send the doctors away or look on the internet about the corona and other things and try to uh, approach wisdom the best we can because my wisdom will be different from yours and it would certainly not be a wisdom of the school, nor the Stoics, nor Plato, nor nothing. And if you take Montaigne wisdom, it's very difficult to say what its content is because it's only for Montaigne and it won't be helpful for you. So there's no choice, you have to craft your own. 
So philosophy, according to this view, is uh, uh, actually uh, helping you form your judgment. It's a pedagogical use, but then you become wise the only way that can be helpful for you by your own means. I didn't say what the uh, asset of tragic philosophy is, let me just say. Tragic philosophy, you remember the one I talked about, the asset is that they say, we can cure anxiety even better maybe than the meaning philosophies. If you understand where you are, you inoculate you against all ills. You open your eyes once and for all and understand the cruelty of it all. So this is sobering. Okay, you do it once, you have your heart broken, but you, 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 you get the conclusions of, of that. You don't say, okay, next time it will be better. Maybe, but there is something that you learned. You understood something about human relationship. Yes? And this is to be treasured. So tragic philosophy actually inoculates you and uh, against uh, anxiety, against maybe depression, by making you open your eyes and understand where do you live, who you are, what are human beings, okay? Now Montaigne is very humble, he doesn't offer that. There's the word, you need wisdom in order to live well, you would like to live well, especially if you're ill, then you have to exercise your judgment, you may need, you know, all he had was a dead friend and some philosophers that wrote books. He didn't have a living friend to talk about that. He couldn't talk to his wife. He had only a daughter. He lost, as he says, five or six children. He doesn't remember. So we as philosophical practitioners can really help people form their judgment the way Montaigne offers that and then helping them become wise according to their own needs and their own capacities, which is important. So this is the cheerful version. The gloomy version of the idea, the idea that ideas are ineffective is Lev Shestov. Uh, you know, the French Russian uh, philosopher that actually influenced all of postmodernism, but is unacknowledged. So um, it's very interesting. He was, you know, a man doing a career in literature till he had some kind of crisis. It's not clear what. Was it a breakdown? What is a depression? He, he never tells. And but from that moment on, he discovered that philosophy is worthless. And he think that there is nothing more terrible than to have to abide according to one criterion, you know, when you are in a terrible situation. So. The last thing he wants is logic at this point. Not only is it ineffective, but it's really hurtful because you cannot contradict yourself. And he says, life contradicts you were a very good person, a very, very uh, uh, moral person. And now you are less than human. You, you are out of the human condition. Everybody walks, you are left outside of everything. Nothing works. Come on, he says, don't try to sell me philosophy. So what does he offer us? He read again all the philosophers and went into their psychologies and tried to understand what happened that made them philosophers, what they are actually saying. It's not right to say that Lev Shestov is a religious philosopher. He never talks directly about God. He only says, listen, nothing is impossible. It's not clear to whom. To the person that understands that that logic doesn't work that phil philosophy's role is actually to find one's own way in the impossible. Of course, you should wish the impossible, you should try the impossible. Reason decides what's possible, what's not possible. It thinks this is a sham. How reason can know what is possible, what is not possible? Reason told him a few things and he fell, <coughs> I'm sorry, into a, a terrible well and maybe he went out of it, but everybody who had a breakdown, anxiety attack, a depression, or a major event in one's life know that most people walk on the sidewalks, but you are in, 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 in a hole and nothing connects you to the human condition. So Lev Shestov is actually less skeptical about philosophy's ability to talk about the human condition for all of us. So this brings us to Hamlet and to others, okay. What philosophy has to offer to a person that really, really was hit by life, either internally or externally? I'm going to leave it an open question for us all. Should we be as pessimistic about philosophy as Lev Shestov says? Should we turn into religion as he hints? 
to offer. He doesn't talk about God. It's not clear if for God everything is possible or for the person who believes. I hope we should don't turn to religion. I hope we can find an answer in philosophy. I don't know. Is the role of the psychologist to help the person get from the hall to the sidewalk and then the philosopher takes him? These are for us questions to uh, deliberate now that I have one minute to finish my talk and to begin finally hearing your ideas about my initial ideas. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Lydia. That's wonderful. Uh, we can't applaud uh, audibly, but you can see the appreciation. You actually have longer than this. If you want to elaborate anything else, we, your talk goes uh, till uh, 10, 15, and oh. then there's 15 minutes of Q&A. Okay. So if you I'm want to, to elaborate something till 10, 15, yeah. then we can start taking questions, okay? Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I thought I have to finish at five. You said one hour, it's my mistake. But I think that this is, these are so loaded questions, you know. This is so deep. There are people all over the world here. We're talking meaning, happiness, misery, philosophy, scope, limitation. Why not hear what people would like to say about these topics? For half an hour, it's better than just answering questions. Good. How okay, that's fine. So, uh, if anyone wants to 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 uh, speak, uh, just uh, jump in, uh, one at a time, please. The rest of you remain muted and uh, address your questions to Lydia, or type them in. If someone wants to type a question into the chat room, I'll be happy to read it out to everybody. However you prefer. Okay, we have the benefit of Lydia's presence, and uh, let's take advantage of it. Lydia, I would like to ask, um, am I, yes, uh, I would like to ask specifically when clients um, approach you with problems related to the COVID uh, epidemic, pandemic, um, how do you, how do you approach that? Which, which model do you use here? I use none of these models. I have actually uh, recorded a video. It was, um, um, David from Mexico asked me and um, it was very practical. I just uh, talked about, um, you know, we have now a criteria to choose a husband and to know how many children to do, you know, don't, don't marry unless you know you can be closed up with that person for six months. Don't have more children that you can handle during a pandemic, yes? And uh, I used it in order to advance philosophy the way that, you know, you can be inoculated about these kind of things through the tragic one. I can tell you, frankly, through the meaning, you can give meaning to whatever is going on. Just be careful not to give meaning to unnecessary death and to viruses. And uh, uh, so this model can, these models can accommodate uh, any aspects of the corona, but I don't speak of them. These are these are thoughts for you. Don't worry. I do not damage my clients. I am okay. very careful with that. We know how careful you are, Lydia. Not, not so careful when you write, though, because you write very expansively. Massimo uh, has, uh, has reminded me that we can raise our hands virtually, those who want to question Lydia, and then I can acknowledge you. So I think Massimo has his hand raised. Please go ahead, Massimo. Uh, thank you, uh, Lydia. I wanted to make a comment and then and then hear what you uh, want to say about it. Uh, about something you mentioned early on in your talk, when you when you brought up the contrast, especially in terms of ancient philosophy, uh, ancient Western philosophy, I should say, between you know personal philosophy as a personal thing. You know, you deal with the situation, it teaches you, it gives you tools to te to deal with a situation, uh, as opposed to as distinct from. Uh, the need for social change, right? So now, as you, uh, some of you, you'll be hearing later on when uh, Sky and I will give our talk, I've uh, been, I'll, I'll be talking about Stoicism. Now, the Stoics are very well known for being like, you know, the, the stiff upper lip, deal with the situation kind of uh, thing, although that is a stereotype to some extent. But there is, there is this, definitely there is an issue, there, there is a component of resilience in the philosophy. It is about as Epictetus says, you know, focus on what you can control and, and then accept the rest 
as it comes because by definition, you cannot control it. However, the Stoics themselves, both in terms of their philosophy and more importantly, in terms of their lives as, as we know them from, from you know, the historical record, actually did engage uh, several times in political change. Uh, Stoic philosophers were actually encouraged to enter into politics and some of them even went so far as to take up arms and you know in an armed rebellion uh, against what they saw as the tyranny first of Julius Caesar in the case of Cato the Younger and then later on against Nero, Vespasian and, and Domitian in the case of the so-called Stoic opposition. So they didn't seem to, to see uh, I guess what I'm suggesting a an opposition or a contradiction between, on the one hand, focusing on what you can do and focusing on your personal philosophy, but at the same time, actually play an active role in changing society. So I don't see the two things as mutually exclusive. Is that the way you see them, or, or, is, or is there some kind of other synthesis that, uh, that you were thinking of? I, I, I see them uh, the way you see them. I know they are different from the Epicureans in that they, they uh, one of the duties was, you know, they saw themselves as citizens of the universe and in the center of circles of duties that goes from the family to the city, to the nation and to the whole universe. And of course, Marcus Aurelius and Seneca, and they, 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 they had uh, important roles and there is no uh, tension here. But, you know, this talk was existential. It offers existential options. So stoicism can work if you want to reach peace of mind, if you actually can prove that the, the world is a cosmos that is rationally, as they, they, they argue, uh, organized, you know, the logos, the, the, the rationality. And as far as you have passions, of course, you are ill, and it's through your reason that you are connected to this logos. And believe me, the stoic uh, therapy doesn't work without that. As in Spinoza, his own therapy, different as it may be from the stoic, doesn't work unless you accept that everything is necessary. So you see, there's a problem with all these theories that offer you uh, uh, these ideals that it actually can work, but you cannot just believe that. You have to know it because otherwise you cannot be at peace. So it's not only accept because it's out of your, your power, it's accept because uh, it's rationally organized, okay? So you have this, this certitude. Are you with me? Sorry, sorry. Yes, I'm, I'm muting myself, and um, I uh, so I actually respond to you in the in the chat. Yeah, that is correct in terms of ancient Stoicism, um, but um, but you know philosophies change uh, by their own their very nature. Uh, Stoicism is certainly not the, the only one. It's not, not the exception. Nobody is a Stoic today in in the same way in which Marcus Aurelius was just. A, just in the same way in which nobody is a Christian today in the way people were Christians 2000 years ago or a Buddhist in the way Buddhists were two and a half millennia ago. Uh, so, you know, philosophies are always dynamic and always change. So a number of modern Stoics have actually been into the, this project of updating Stoicism, in particular in terms of the, uh, the metaphysics, because most people today don't believe that the universe is a living organism and that with the logos. Uh, Lawrence Baker was, is probably the most prominent of them in his uh, in new Stoicism. And so there, there are ways of recapturing much, although not all, I agree, of what the ancient Stoics yeah. were saying. Sure, if there is a, a universal providence, and as Epictetus says, I am the foot uh, that, has, uh, that is part of a larger body. The body has to step into the mud and it's up to me to cross the street and it's up to me f as a foot to stop in the, step in the mud, fine. Then, then makes you, you, can make, you can be happy, meaning uh, if, you f if you believe that there is a, a bigger purpose that you're serving. Modern Stoics cannot help themselves with that sort of stuff. Um, but I actually would suggest that that doesn't really change that much. What that means is that instead of going for amor fati, as the famous uh, phrase by Nietzsche goes, you know, instead of embracing your face, uh, your, your fate, you have to uh, in, endure it. You have to, you know, you still have it, but it's still true. Um, the, the, the basic stoic notion that you still have a dichotomy of control, the things are up to you and other things are not up to you, it's still true. 
And it's still true that it's rational to focus on the things you can change and develop an attitude of equanimity toward the ones that you cannot change. For instance, like the Christian yeah. serenity prayer says, right? So, so what I'm saying is, yes, you're absolutely right in terms of the ancient version of Stoicism, but, um, but you know, philosophies do change over time. And that one of the current projects uh, is precisely to update um, the bits and pieces that need to be updated. Well, the fact that, uh, you know, you can control only what you can and uh, the rest you cannot, this is always true regardless of stoicism. The problem is that we never know what we can control and what not. Tell a young man or young woman about their career in America, uh, you know, everybody wants the optimistic version. But uh, many things, if they will succeed or not, it's not clear what depends on them and what not. So there is a tragic aspect here that many people do not want to hear about. You can do everything right and not succeed, no? And it's a great mystery. And uh, of course you can take Stoicism or any theory and make it a neo version and, and leave out metaphysics. I don't know why we should do that. Uh, Stoicism actually works very well when you really know or believe or, 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 or think that, uh, that, that, that it's very, very probable that you are a vital part of the sole organism that is the universe. So everything then holds uh, together. I don't say that we should uh, give up metaphysics today. Absolutely not. If we want a very, very good, solid ethics of peace of mind, it's always based on metaphysics. We should go uh, with the Pyrrhonist maybe and the peace of mind of the Pyrrhonist if we are not sure that the Stoics, Stoics uh, metaphysics would work or the Epicureans uh, uh, are better option. But the question is, uh, should philosophy, in order to be helpful to human beings, embrace the notion of meaning? Or uh, can we at all address human misery? Or is our tool, which is actually reason, uh, not very well adjusted when there is misfortune or misery uh, that, that, that happens to someone? These are the questions that we should deal with. Of course, we can listen like philosophers at the story, the story of the person. Psychologists may listen better. Why philosophers? Why can we bring to people when they are in utter misery, okay? In depression and anxiety or when they lost a loved one? Uh, should we be substitute uh, priests? Uh, what is exactly our role? So if we offer meaning, this is one option to show that actually many people die, not only you have lost a child, not in that way, of course, but to show the human reality, the tragic reality and making the person accept that reality because this is the truth. This is another option. And to help the person uh, educate his or her judgment in order to find out wisdom for he or her, this is another option. And I would like to hear what every one of you thinks, where are you? Are you in the meaning? Yeah. Are yeah. you in the, in the, in the uh, uh, judgment? Uh, are you like Lev Chestov thinking that, you know, uh, only we, we should yearn for the impossible because we don't know what's possible? Are you more like uh, the tragic philosophers that says have a clear, lucid, sovereign view uh, to reality? Only philosophers could do that. Psychologists cannot do that, you know? have this tragic vision that it's very lucid. Where is Lydia, our... Lydia, we, we have uh, more questions coming, okay? Yeah. So uh, I'm okay. going to call on Andre in a moment. I, I would just like to say to Massimo uh, and to, I guess, Sky, when we're going to come back to you on this. Undoubtedly, this issue is going to come up again, just to, just to throw it into the pot. Um, I mean, yeah, I understand why you would want to update Stoicism, but when I use it with clients, the very things that are helpful are exactly the nuggets that we mine from the original texts. And the same with Buddhism. The very things that are helpful to clients are in the early uh, teachings, uh, you know, of Theravada or indeed in some of the Mahayana Sutras, which are still ancient by our light. So what, what, is, the, what is the paradox here? If it, if it needs to be updated, how come the old stuff is still useful? We'll come back to you on this, Massimo. I'm sure you'll do some explaining for us, but we'll, I'm going to be very curious to hear your thoughts on that, okay, later. Um, and meanwhile, Andre, you have, a, you have a, a question or comment, please. Andre from Brazil, welcome. Thank you, Lou. 
So uh, the question here and the comment, and then I'm, I'm looking forward to see what Lydia has to say about it is about the, the contribution of philosophical practice. And uh, I would like to suggest that part of that contribution is the issue of the perspective from which we look at something, okay, or the client look at something. And I will illustrate that with one specific point that you mentioned, which relates to suffering. And you offer the possibility of uh, philosophical practice being or not being useful as a way of uh, alleviating suffering through looking at the meaning of suffering. To that view, I would like to add that there is a distinction between uh, the idea of the meaning of suffering and the idea of the value of suffering. And that's what I find really, really interesting in terms of a, a contribution that philosophical practice can give. So uh, in order to uh, illustrate this, the, what I mean by the, the, the value of suffering, I will just simply use uh, an image from a, a Brazilian philosopher called Ruben Alves, which says, uh, happy, Oysters make no pearls. Happy oysters make no pearls. And literally what he describes the process because uh, in the, like perfect ideal oysters, they are supposed to be like impenetrable. But some oysters are not. So a little piece of sand gets in and it, it scratches the, the oyster, it hurts the oyster. So in order to deal with that, the, the oyster makes something that encompasses the, the, the little sand that is hurting, is scratching, and that turns out to be later on the pearls. So happy oysters make no pearls. And, and from that I get the suggestion that part of the, the, the important kind of contribution that philosophical practice can give has to do not so much with alleviating suffering, even though that, that may be part of the, the job, right? But uh, making the most out of it in terms of using that suffering as a fuel for self-development. So that's the thought. I just want to say you are aware of the fact that creating pearls bring ex more suffering to the oysters. You know that. What? I, I don't know that. I don't know. Well, you know, you know what happens to oysters that have pearls. No, please tell me. <laughs> okay. So that's the problem with this uh, analogy that creating pearls may be a beautiful thing in itself or for other people, but creates more suffering for the oysters. So we would all like to be happy oysters. This would help us survive better than having pearls. But it's true that uh, uh, the value of, of suffering is different than the meaning of happiness. The way of the meaning is not necessarily of suffering, is of our own lives, is understanding where we are. We have a 2,500 years of philosophical theories that try to explain that. And also a lot, very rich, many other very rich tradition in, 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 the, in, the, in the East. I think that many people that come to philosophical practice or many person that happen something terrible in their lives, they, we all have a sense of justice and injustice, which is not very rational. It's not very clear where it comes from because life is unjust, but we have this, this yearning for justice. And we, we, want, uh, uh, we want that injustice done to us explained. And you say something of value. You say, well, don't go for justice. Go for what can you do of value with what happened to you. 
I understand that. I lost my two parents. I know they are not my children. This is why I've written all these books <laughs> suddenly. But I know that whatever life there was in them is in me and only in me. So I, I try to do something with that. So I understand that point. So this is, uh, this is a valuable uh, contribution to um, uh, counselors. It's a thought for us. Would we like to open the options to a philosophical counselor? Say, okay, I can give you meaning and narrative. There's a lot. I can give you the tragic alternative and I can give you the, 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 the third alternative, which is uh, judgment and maybe the idea that philosophy is not of much uh, use, yes. So should we do that or should we decide for the client that we give him or her meaning or narrative? Maybe the tragic aspect, maybe I, 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 I didn't present it as well as I could, Jose version, my version, maybe it's a rich alternative that has not been, because it's very frightening, has not been uh, labeled enough, understood enough. This is the only, this only philosophers can do. Help with lucidity. We are not, it's not about uh, literature. It's helping having a more lucid view of reality. We can accompany that. It's an interesting path. It's not a desperate one. We tend to forget that tragic philosophy is not pessimistic. It's not absurd. Yes, Lydia, and it can and, become comical. And your work on humor and and yeah. homo ridiculous, ridiculous however the, yes. yeah the, the 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 idea of ridiculousness is but of course not every client is ready to see themselves in that light but it can be really helpful i agree with you at particular times um we have a question or comment from john tambornino john please okay thank you uh lydia thank you that was a tour de force and my question is, is very similar it may be just i'm not understanding the some of the basic points you're making, but as a philosophical counselor, it seems there's a number of ways one could practice. One would be to decide that one's a, a stoic, uh, stoicist, and sort of that's it. You'd, you'd expect clients to sort of work within that, that perspective or paradigm. The other would be to sort of introduce clients to these fundamental philosophical, metaphysical, ontological, theological bases of perspectives. So first, see if the client's interested in a notion of divine logos. And if they are, then talk about the ways that, ex that extends into a, a stoicist uh, ethics. And the third would be that the client comes to you and if they're interested in flourishing, you sort of take them in the Aristotelian direction. If they're interested in, in tranquility, you take them in the Epicurean stoicist direction. If they're interested in meaning, you talk about Nietzsche and Camus. And so there's a certain relativism in that you're just, you know, you're helping them try on different different hats, essentially. Um, and just, just, again, this is really basic, just which of these are a third approach or, or a fourth approach are you using when a client just comes to you cold and, and says they're unhappy or their, their life is meaningless? I use none of these options. This is a meta philosophic discussion. It's not about philosophical practice directly. It's about philosophy and its possibility, its role, its limitation in everyday life. These are philosophers we should think about that for ourselves. In the practice, I have my own methods. I never voice my own opinions. I ask the person after she or he told me their problem or their interest to, to formulate one question. If the question is philosophical, I can enter into a dialogue. Uh, if a person quarrels with a friend about money and uh, the question finally is what is friendship or what is the value of money in life, I can enter a dialogue. Let's say we go for the question, what is friendship? I say, okay, uh, let's take this question. There are two presuppositions, one that there is something like friendship, the other is that uh, there is one thing that is friendship. I explain the two presuppositions. Then I say, please give me your first answer to that. What is friendship? Then the person does that. Then after a few meetings, I said, give me another answer. 
your friends answer. And it's very, very difficult. And he does that. And then I said, give me a third one. And if he cannot, I bring the box. I said, he listen, read Aristotle, read Cicero, read Montaigne on La Boissy, go home, come back. We have a fourth and a fifth answer. Then we begin criticizing each of the answers. Then we have a new question. At that point, the person can go or stay or come back later. The next question is either related to the first one or not. My role is to open the options. And then there is like a map of, you know, he wants after that we talk about the value of money or this. And on the way, I give that person the tools of better judgment. I give the history of philosophy. I give ways, I give meaning because I say your problem of friendship is the same all over the history of human beings. Look, the ancient Greeks, look Montaigne, look that, okay? Of course, there is a tragic option that I may hear that friendship does not exist. This is also an option, or there is an ambivalence within human beings. But this is my method. This is what I follow, just in order to be transparent for the client because they don't know what philosophical practice is. So I say, this is the way we are going to do. So at each step of the road, he or she knows where we are. And he or she can go away and come back and we can continue. And he or she gets the tools to do it on their own after that, with another question, okay? So it's a gift. They say it's a gift. They, 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 they finally find a way of saying what friendship is, then trying to evaluate what friendship is for the other, yes? And then, you, you understand what I'm doing, yes? And yes. it's welcome to the human condition. Uh, but I don't go into, these things will, will go if people will ask me about meaning, if meaning exists or not, you know? So this will be more about that. Or if a person would be in misery, would religion help more than philosophy or literature? So this is the kind of meta question that we are talking about here. Lydia? Thank you very much for that. And you've also illustrated in the process why we have situated philosophical practice as an educational activity yeah. and not as a medical or psychological or, or anything else. Uh, it's educational. And, then, and that's exactly how we help our clients by enlarging their perspective in all these yeah. di directions. So thank you. We have time for Patricia, who has... Uh, a couple of words, a QA and a uh, from you, Patricia, please go ahead. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So yes, first of all, thanks to, to Lydia because I found the, this, her speech very, of course, very interesting and enriching. And just to just just a couple of uh, of thoughts of reflections uh the, the the last question regarding the contribution uh, of philosophy to our clients or our friends uh in in this moment but even in in, in normal existential moments are to me and i and i i just uh, just follow her her suggestion but then i i want to, to come to the I mean, I I'm follow the, the Socratic tradition and the Stoic tradition because there uh, I can find the, the, the way to, to, to go over and to, and to trace a, a path, a, a route. And uh, to link, uh, to, to create a link between the Stoic and, and the Neo-Stoic tradition and uh, the, the, the reflection of Lydia regarding tragedy and, uh, and it, a more existential dimension, maybe an author that I've rediscovered recently is Simone Weil. And uh, Simone Weil really um, uh, used to, to, to refer to, the, to, the, uh, to philosophy as, as something very practical and very, uh, and very um, helpful in, uh, in any, any moment. Like, like when, when she says, when she writes then, than Socrates, uh, in, when, when he was awaiting for death in prison, he was learning to play the lyre. And this is kind of, uh, of, of example that I, I tend to, to, to transmit to my clients. So you are in a very uh, individual and, and also for him a political, critical moment. He was in prison, but he was trying to learn to play an instrument. And this is something 
and, and I, 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 I use the same kind of, and, and, and Weil and, and myself reading against Seneca, I find the same kind of, uh, of, um, of help and uh, a sort of, not, not only rational, but as extension, even, even referring also to Weiss, to Simone Weiss, when she says oh, it, it is not, it's not necessary to, to believe in immortality, because uh, it is, it's when, when you say, and she says so, but, but I, I help, I find some help in this word, when it is just a change to say, when, when you lose, when, you, when, you, when you've lost your relatives, as you said before, and as I did uh, regarding my mother when she was very young, and, and, and I, it's just a switch of your mind, of your thought from this wonderful person does exist, which is now, uh, to the thought this wonderful person has existed. And if you accept this, I think this is a, this is, I mean, this is the way I, I, I face the, the problems, not only in this peculiar global moment, but in, in any kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, and, uh, and another part that of your speech that I really like is all your reflection regarding meaning, which, which of course we could talk for a long time. And uh, a nice contribution, I'm reading in these days really, it's, uh, it's this small book by, by well, I, I send you through the message, is a French author called Rimas, and it's a small booklet uh, entitled Du Sens. I'm reading in Italian, but mm -hmm. I don't know. And it's the difference mm -hmm. between sense, the sense, and the meaning. And mm -hmm. the sense is what you, I think, what I, what, I, uh, what I think to have understood of what you're saying. The sense is the meaning which becomes something that goes into you so you can just share your experience with another mm -hmm. human being's experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would just want to say that there is a difference between myself when I put myself at the service of the clients and once a year when we should refresh ourselves and actually come to probe our own minds and see where we are in life with our experiences and our philosophers. We evolve, we change, we think we killed an issue, we solved it and then it renew itself, you know. So it's yeah. good. I can be a person whose vision of meaning is a little bit uh, different than most people, but I won't impose this on my clients. You know, I never, this is why they see me not as Lydia, but as a professional philosopher. And yes, as yes. A, as a teacher, there is a great difference between my, I always bring my whole personality in everything. But I, because I'm a professional, I can explain each philosophy uh, the best I can without saying one word when I explain it on, on me before criticizing it without uh, trying to uh, uh, diminish its, its value. And I think that between sense and meaning, there is a, a great deal. I think the French, the 20th century was the century that the French put the idea of meaning and sense yeah. Uh, yeah. to the test. And this is what yeah, I learned from... From, from that last book that I had to, to write. And I know that I know French, so it was easier for me. We should educate ourselves there. there, there yeah. there's, there's more than meets uh, you know, the eye. For, at first we think, okay, postmodernism. But Clément Rosset was a surprise for me. You know, yes, so I, I will follow you, yes, because I didn't know the author, so I will do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Lydia, you. We could spend very happily all day with you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and continue this. It's been delightful. We also have to adhere as uh, somewhat professionals to our own internal schedule. So it is time for a break. Um, thank you so much for this. It, it has been recorded. We'll see how the video turns out and hopefully we'll be able okay. to share it with you and the others. Thank you so much, Lydia. Uh, thank have you. a good move. Uh, it's great thank to you. see you. Great to hear you and keep up all this wonderful work. Okay. It's really. I, I have. <laughs> Tremendous. I have to apologize. I would like very much, you know me better than that. I never leave after my lecture, but I have the boxes. I just cannot. I have to leave the conference at this point. I really deeply apologize. Lydia, you have our blessing if you want that you know. uh, for what it's worth. <laughs> have our blessing and have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful rest of your day. We'll Thank be in you. touch, okay?
Thank you uh, thank very you much. Thank you so much. Listen, everyone, bye please bye. don't get lost. Do some, get up, have a coffee, do some yoga, uh, yes. you know, <laughs> get, get a pearl from an oyster or whatever. Uh, we, we resume in, in 11 minutes. 10, at 10.45, we will welcome Professor Devaraconza, okay? So please take an 11-minute break, and we'll see you all at 10.45. Thank you. Thank you for a lovely Lydia. Thank you.